everyone. Uh, this is Carrie Wills. So the intention today is to talk about some guiding principles of what I call a consultative approach. And so the, the intent today is to go over, one, what is a consultative approach? Two, it would be the eight guiding principles, uh, what those are and how to leverage them on your programs. And then is then obviously how to apply them to the different functions of the program, thus applying guiding principles, uh, which is the name of, of the, uh, the webinar. Into what a consultative approach is, it probably makes sense to talk about what it's not. And, and here you can see kind of a, a Dilbert cartoon where uh, Dogbert comes in and says, I've been hired to identify the most important goals of your organization. And Dilbert asks, well, how do you plan to do that? First, I'll ask you what they are, and then you'll tell me. I'll put some answers in a PowerPoint slide, and then next week I'll show you the slide to tell you to focus on your most important goals, and then I'll get paid, which is my most important goal. And then uh, he gets excited and says that he leads by example. Uh, so I did spend uh, seven years at Accenture as a as a con IT consultant, and uh, this is probably the perception of what uh, what a consultative model is. But I can tell you that's that's not what I'm going to be talking about today. What out is a kind of a background and a case for what is the consultative approach. We'll talk about uh, a little bit about kind of the characteristics of that. As mentioned, I'll focus on the eight guiding principles. And then we'll, we'll spend some time on how we can apply them to the programs that we that we manage. In context and talk about the background, uh, as I'm sure everybody on this call knows, the, the landscape of business and, and therefore programs uh, has been changing significantly over the last, call it two decades, whether that's global competition, uh, more demanding shareholders, you know, technology evolving. Uh, as everyone knows, we've had a pretty volatile economy over the last, uh, certainly the last 10 years. And companies are placing larger bets, which really means that programs are, are much bigger. Uh, the current program I'm on now is a, uh, is a nine-figure program for Cigna. And I think 10 years ago, there weren't many companies that had nine-figure programs. I can tell you this is one of three that our program has uh, just this year alone. And so I think uh, you know, Cigna is a kind of Fortune 100 uh, U.S.-based company, but I think it's probably indicative of a lot of the, the other companies in the marketplace. So what do all these trends mean? Well, programs are becoming much bigger, much more complex, lots of dependencies outside the program, resources and organizations are becoming more complex uh, and requiring a lot more controls. And so again, the, the example I'll use is the program that I'm on now has 33 projects Un organized under five kind of sub-programs under the one program that, that I have. So a lot of complexity, a, a lot of uh, coordination required. And visual representation of what that might look like. So in a traditional program, the program's pretty insulated. It's got a bunch of projects and the resources report up to the project manager and they kind of live in their bubble uh, and everybody's happy. And uh, I think people would agree with me that in today's landscape, it looks much more like the picture on the bottom where some things contained within the program, there's dependencies on projects outside the program, there's dependencies on resources who are outside the program, the resources are, are partially uh, allocated to different programs and therefore have different focus. And so, so I would propose that the, the programs of today look much more like the ones on the bottom. While programs are getting more complex, delivery continues to remain low. Uh, the chaos report from the Spanish group is kind of a, a standard uh, kind of metric on the productivity of projects. And you can see that we're still at about, call it a third, that uh, we're successful. And so programs are getting much more complex. Delivery remains, uh, successful delivery remains low. And so I'd argue that's the business case for why we need to have a more consultative approach. And so, you know, I, I've talked about this term a couple times, and, and what does that mean? Uh, and it really means using the consultative skills and techniques to influence outcomes. Things like negotiating, influencing, uh, persuasion, communication, uh, you know, and, and so on. And, and I think those are important skills to have because uh, the dynamics of the environment are changing. Programs need much more transparency on how they're tracking against items, a lot more stakeholders and people who need to be influenced and involved, uh, and, and so on. And, and so I think you'll see in a couple slides, I don't think we can rely on pure kind of fundamental project management skills. To me, those are table stakes. Can you make a project plan? Can you do a risk log? 
it's the consultative ones that I would argue are the ones that, that are needed to manage these large and complex programs. And, and to give you a sense of that, uh, I think it was maybe the 50s or the 60s, there were two psychologists, uh, French and Raven, who did a study on the five types of power that people can have. So if we apply that to our roles as project managers, given the current landscape, you know, let's take each one of them. So there's legitimate power where, uh, you know, the team reports to us directly. Most of us work in matrix environments. And, you know, I mentioned as I ha while I have 33 projects and we have about 10 direct reports. And so I think that's probably uh, similar to, to a lot of the other environments. So I, I would argue we probably don't have legitimate power, in which case, you know, the entire project team reports to us. There's expert power, but, you know, that's having uh, domain expertise and knowledge in your area. But we talked about uh, uh, technology and the business becoming much more complex. So I'm not sure that any one person could be an expert in the area that they're managing just because of, uh, of the growth of the complexity. There's reward power, which says, you know, I can give somebody a bonus or, or I can sort of reward them, which, you know, I think we have a little bit of that as project managers, but uh, I'd argue probably not a lot. There's coercive power, which is the opposite, uh, the ability to punish somebody. And, you know, we probably have some of that, but I would argue that's not a very good uh, long-term strategy for, for motivating the team. And then there's referential power, which is the relationships that you have. So if you look at these five types of power, I, I would argue the only one that we have and the one that we should be investing our most time in is referential power, which are some of those consultative skills that we talked about. Let's kind of take an example of, of the traditional program versus a consultative program and, and kind of see the differences. So from an influencing uh, point of view, in a traditional program, as mentioned, direct report of men, uh, resources, everybody kind of rolls up. Today's type of program, very indirect, partial uh, resources. They work in other organizations. It could include vendors and, and third parties and other companies. There's stakeholders all over the place who need to be uh, influenced and negotiated with. We went from managing a specific plan to talking about managing expectations and understanding you know, scope and costs and different type of levers to pull as we have to negotiate uh, uh, different challenges and decisions that need to be made. Uh, we talked again about directly managing the plan versus integrating a lot of different resources and plans that span across areas. Uh, it's, it's, it's similar. Uh, whether or not we're talking about, they're based on, on perception as opposed to focusing much more on a fact base and understanding implications of decisions. Uh, similarly around information versus uh, insight. So, and then obviously vendors are a big part of, of today's environment. And I think in the past they were viewed as vendors, subcontractors to be kind of squeezed as much as possible. And, and I would argue in today's environment, much more have to consider them as partners who, who are at the table trying to help deliver. So, you know, while it's the same type of work, the same category of work, the, the landscape and the approach uh, have very much evolved. And, and I think we need to recognize that and evolve our approach of program management to, to align. Otherwise, we just won't be successful. Right? It's kind of a, a, a model that I've used on uh, you know, everything from $5 million projects to $500 million projects is this sort of kind of matrix model where you have a vertical uh, project that's focused on executing a particular delivery, and then you've got horizontals that span across those projects. Now, obviously, most of this, I should mention, uh, webinar is, is focused on program management. That is a collection of projects under a particular program, but I think uh, uh, we can apply this to work streams under projects as well. I, the model's uh, sc scalable that way. And so the horizontals are really domain leads who need to make sure that there's consistency uh, and standards across those areas. 